from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Thank you all for coming. A great crowd on a cold January day, uh, an important day in January, um, uh, but not the most hospitable weather-wise. Uh, my name is Rob Casper. I'm the head of the Poetry and Literature Center here at the Library of Congress, and I would like to welcome you to our very first Literary Birthdays event for the spring, celebrating writer, writer Zora Neale Hurston. Um, before we begin, let me ask you to please uh, turn off your cell phones and any other electronic devices you might have uh, that could interfere with our event. Uh, we don't have a Q&A session, but just note that this program is being recorded and uh, by participating in whatever way you give us permission for future use of this recording. A little bit of, a little bit of boilerplate, I have to say. Um, also, let me tell you a little bit about the Poetry and Literature Center. Uh, we are home to the Poet Laureate Consultant in Poetry, and we put on literary readings, uh, panels, lectures, and other sorts of events uh, throughout the year. I saw a number of you signing up our sign-up sheet out in the front. Uh, if you haven't and you'd like to know more about literary events like this here at the library, please do so. Uh, we also have um, a list of our upcoming events uh, this spring. Uh, which are very exciting, uh, so you can pick that up as well. Or you can go to our website, which is www.lsc.gov slash poetry. Uh, we are th thrilled today to be here to honor Hurston on what would have been her 123rd birthday. Uh, we tried to do this event last year. It didn't work out, so um, it's really exciting to be here uh, this year. Uh, you can read more about our featured uh, writer and uh, our two readers, Marina Golden and Dolan Perkins Valdez, uh, in the program which is on your seat. Uh, I'd like to give a special thanks to both. Uh, first to Dolan for uh, agreeing to do this uh, two years in a row, uh, and then to Marita uh, for joining us uh, not only as a great writer, but also as the founder, one of the founders of the Hurston Wright Foundation. Uh, to find out more about the foundation and its work to discover, mentor, and honor black writers, you should visit its website, www.hurstonwright.org. Uh, the Hurston Wright Foundation also has uh, an event this evening celebrating um, its namesake at uh, 6 o'clock p.m. at the Pepco Edison Gallery, which is on 70, 701 9th Street. It is a dramatic reading of Their Eyes Are Watching God. So uh, if you want to do a full Zora and Neil Hurston day, um, there's, there's programs for you to, to uh, partake in. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about this program. Uh, our two featured readers will read their favorite passages from Hurston's work and connect them to their own writing. Uh, following the readings, Catherine Kirst of the American Folklife Center will give a presentation with video about the, the center's Hurston holdings. Uh, and I also wanna thank Anna Hoog for helping set that up. Um, but Zora Neale Hurston, is such an influential writer and historic figure that two other library divisions have teamed up to celebrate her today. Uh, after the event is over, we ask that you come up uh, and check out the tabletop display of Hurston materials, which are from both our manuscript and rare books and special collections divisions. And thanks to Alice Burney and Rosemary Placas uh, from those respective divisions uh, for creating this play. It's one of the exciting things about this series that we not only connect living writers to historic writers, but we show the holdings that the library has um, to uh, make sure that future generations can connect to um, these important voices. Uh, in our history. Finally, I would like to take a moment to honor Rosemary Placas, who is retiring after a long and distinguished career at the library. For decades, her dedication and expertise has set an example for others to follow, and she will be much missed. Uh, she's also been a big part of the development of this series. So, Rosemary, if you wouldn't mind standing and if you wouldn't mind giving me a, giving her a hand. Uh, and now I'd like to turn things over our, to our readers. So please join me in welcoming Marita Golden and Dolan Perkins Valdez.
I want to thank you for inviting me to be part of this. This is like a great day for me. I celebrate Zora in the afternoon, celebrate her in the evening. You know, what gets better than that? Um, just two small things. It's, it, it was my mistake. Actually, tonight's program is going to be 701 8th Street. It's, it's the gallery which is behind the Pepco building. It's a lovely space which um, we use for a number of our readings. And another little um, historical fact, this is the 17th anniversary year of the publication of Black Boy by Richard Wright. And um, Wright was, in many ways, Hurston's nemesis, if you know anything about their history, but he was also her fellow Southern genius. And um, if you visit our website, you'll get information about the fact that this is our 25th anniversary at the Hurston Wright Foundation. When I was thinking about what I would read um, today, I thought about how important Hurston was for me uh, as a role model for how to live my life as a writer. I think that as writers, we often will learn from other writers a lot about craft. Um, a lot about the nuts and bolts, the technique of writing. But when I discovered Hurston um, in the mid-70s, she was most important to me for the way she lived her life, uh, with fearlessness, with a sense of adventure, enormous resilience, and also a lot of faith. I also found her to be very important because our lives intersected in some important ways. Um, sh she had a mother who told her to jump at the sun. I had a mother and a father who told me to jump at the sun. Um, my mother died when I, was in my, when I was 21. Her mother died when she was nine. And when I read about her journey through life, I really identified with her sense of being, to some extent, orphaned and having to create a way and make a way and shape a way for herself in the world. And finally, I was really influenced by the fact that she was a woman of letters. That is, she wrote fiction, she wrote nonfiction, she wrote short stories, she wrote screenplays. Uh, and she did that in part because she was actually trying to live as a writer. And so I found myself, as I developed my career, really being inspired by her in many ways and really telling younger writers that they should em emulate her choice to be a woman of letters rather than just you know, a fiction writer to try to write absolutely everything. So I'm going to read from um, the collection I Love Myself When I'm Laughing. This is um, a section from the um, autobiography, Dust Tracks on the Road. And I'm going to read a, a bit from the section uh, when her mother dies and a bit from the section when she goes to Jacksonville. She's sent after her mother's death to Jacksonville uh, to attend a boarding school. Mama exhorted her children at every opportunity to jump at the sun. We might not land on the sun, but at least we would get off the ground. Papa did not feel so hopeful. Let well enough alone. It did not do for Negroes to have too much spirit. He was always threatening to break mine or kill me in the attempt. My mother was always standing between us. She conceded that I was impotent and given to talking back, but she didn't want to, quote, squinch my spirit too much for fear that I would turn out to be a mealy-mouthed rag doll by the time I got grown. It was not long after Mama came home that she began to be less active. Then she took to bed. I knew she was ailing, but she was always frail, so I did not take it too much to heart. I was nine years old, and even though she had talked to me very earnestly one night, I could not conceive of Mama actually dying. She had talked of it many times. That day, September 18th, she had called me and given me certain instructions. I was not to let them take the pillow from under her head until she was dead. The clock was not to be covered, nor the looking glass. She trusted me to see to it that these things were not done. I promised her as solemnly as a nine-year-old could do that I would see to it. What years of agony that promise gave me. In the first place, I had no idea that it would be soon. 
But that same day near sundown, I was called upon to set my will against my father, the village dams, dames and village custom. I know now that I could not have succeeded. I would left Mama and was playing outside for a little while when I noted a number of women going inside Mama's room and staying. It looked strange, so I went on in. Papa was standing at the foot of the bed looking down on my mother, who was breathing hard. As I crowded in, they lifted up the bed and turned it around so that Mama's eyes would face the east. I thought that she looked to me as the head of the bed was reversed. Her mouth was slightly open, but her breathing took up so much of her strength that she could not talk. But she looked at me, or so I felt, to speak for her. She depended on me for a voice. The master maker in his making had made old death, made him with big soft feet and square toes, made him with a face that reflects the face of all things, but neither changes itself nor is mirrored anywhere made the body of death out of infinite hunger, made a weapon for his hand to satisfy his needs. This was the morning of a day of the beginning of things, but death had no home and he knew it at once. And where shall I dwell in my dwelling? Old death asked, for he was already old when he was made. You shall build you a place close to the living, get far out of the sight of eyes, wherever there's a building there you have a platform that comprehends the four roads of the winds. For your hunger, I give you the first and last taste of all things. We had been born, so death had had his first taste of us. We had built things, so he had his platform in our yard. And now death stirred from his platform in his secret place in our yard and came inside the house. Somebody reached for the clock while Mrs. Maddie Clark put her hand to the pillow to take it away. Don't, I cried. Don't take the pillow from under Mama's head. She said she didn't want it moved. I made to stop Mrs. Maddie, but Papa pulled me away. Others were trying to silence me. I could see the huge drop of sweat collected in the hollow at Mama's elbow, and it hurt me so. They were covering the clock and the mirror. Don't cover up the clock. Leave that looking glass like it is. Let me put Mama's pillow back where it was. But Papa held me tight and the others frowned me down. Mama was still rasping out the last morsel of her life. I think she was trying to say something, and I think she was trying to speak to me. What was she trying to tell me? What wouldn't I give to know? Perhaps she was telling me that it was better for the pillow to be moved so that she, she could die easy, as they say. Perhaps she was accusing me of weakness and failure in carrying out her last wish. I do not know. I shall never know. Just then, death finished his prowling through the house on its padded feet and entered the room. He bowed to Mama in his way, and she made her manners and left us to act out ceremonies over unimportant things. I was to agonize over that moment for years to come, in the midst of play, in wakeful moments after midnight, on the way home from parties, and even in the classroom during lectures. My thoughts would escape occasionally from their confines and stare down at me. Now I know that I could not have had my way against the world. The world we lived in required those acts. Anything else would have been sacrilege, and no nine-year-old voice was going to thwart them. My father was with the mores. He had restrained me physically from outraging the ceremonies established for the dying. If there is any consciousness after death, I hope that Mama knows that I did my best. She must know how I have suffered for my failure. But life picked me up from the foot of Mama's bed, grief, self-despisement, and all, and set my feet in strange ways. That moment was the end of a phase in my life. I was old before my time with grief of loss, of failure, and of remorse. No matter what the others did, my mother had put her trust in me. She had felt that I could and would carry out her wishes, and I had not. And then, in that sunset time, I failed her. It seemed as she died that the sun it seemed as as she died that the sun went down on purpose to flee away from me. That hour began my wanderings, not so much in geography, but in time, then not so much in time as in spirit. Mama died at sundown and changed the world, that is, the world which had been built out of her body and her heart. 
even the physical aspects fell apart with a suddenness that was startling. School in Jacksonville was one of those twilight things. It was not dark, but it lacked the bold sunlight that I craved. I worshiped two of my teachers and loved ginger snaps with cheese and sour pickles. But I was deprived of the loving pine, the lakes, the wild violets in the woods, and the animals I used to know. No more holding down first base on the team with my brothers and their friends, just a jagged hole where my home used to be. At times, the girls at the school were lined up two and two and taken for a walk. On one of these occasions, I had an experience that set my heart to fluttering. I saw a woman sitting on a porch who looked at a distance like Mama. Maybe it was Mama. Maybe she was not dead at all. They had made some mistake. Mama had gone to Jacksonville, and they thought she was dead. The woman was sitting in a rocking chair, just like Mama always did. It must be Mama. But before I came abreast of the porch, in my rigid place in line, the woman got up and went inside. I wanted to stop and go in, but I didn't even breathe my hope to anyone. I made up my mind to run away someday and find the house and let Mama know where I was. But before I did, the hope that the woman really was my mother passed, I accepted my bereavement. Thank you. Um, thank you, Rob, for the invitation to come and celebrate Zora. And thank you, Matt. And um, thank you to the staff at the Library of Congress for bringing these beautiful first edition books. And thank you to Marita for reminding me of that passage, which I haven't read in a long time. Um, my, my take on Zora is, I would say, very irreverent because I believe she was irreverent, and I believe if she were here right now, she would have something smart and sassy and off-color to say, and it would make everybody uncomfortable. <laughs> and um, <laughs> I remember when I first discovered her, I thought every picture that I saw of her, she looked like a completely different person. And, um, and that's sort of what you'll hear, the difference between um, the beautiful, lovely um, piece that Marita just read from, and what I'll read from, which is <laughs> <laughs> um, her essay that she published in 1934 called Characteristics of Negro Expression. And um, I thought today that I would, and it, you, know, I, you know, depending on how much time we have, I was going to read like a couple of paragraphs from one of my short stories that I think really uh, exemplifies her influence on me, because I thought today that I would just talk about um, her influence on everyone who writes in African-American vernacular, um, that she really um, helped us to create a roadmap of that. When we were looking for a way to recreate African-American speech on the page, and we, we didn't want to do what Mark Twain had done, you know, Zora was who we looked to. And of course, if you wanted to go earlier than Zora, you could go back to Charles Chestnut. But for me, you know, going to school and college in the 90s and discovering Zora, because I didn't hear of her in high school in Memphis, um, Zora was my roadmap. But I, then I thought, you know, Zora really influenced every, every way that we look at African American vernacular, period, not just dialect. And so I went back to this essay, um, and I just wanted to read, uh, a, I'm going to sort of read a few passages from it. Characteristics of Negro Expression. She says, uh, Every phase of Negro life is highly dramatized. No matter how joyful or how sad the case, there is sufficient poise for drama. Everything is acted out, unconsciously for the most part, of course. There is an impromptu ceremony always ready for every hour of life. No little moment passes unadorned. Um, she basically says everything that Negroes do is drama. We're just a dramatic people. <laughs> The primitive man exchanges descriptive words. His terms are all close-fitting. Frequently, the Negro, even with detached words in his vocabulary, not evolved in him but transplanted on his tongue by contact, must add action to it to make it do. So we have chop axe, sit in chair, cook pot, and the like, because the speaker has in his mind the picture of the object in use, action, 
everything illustrated. So we can say the white man thinks in a written language and the Negro thinks in hieroglyphics. <laughs> A bit of Negro drama familiar to all is the frequent meeting of two opponents who threaten to do atrocious murder one upon the other. Who has not observed a robust young Negro chap posing upon a street corner, possessed of nothing but his clothing, his strength, and his youth? Does he bear himself like a pauper? No, Louis XIV could be no more insolent in his assurance. His eyes say plainly, female, halt. His posture exults, ah, female, I am the eternal male, the giver of life. Behold in my hot flesh all the delights of this world. <laughs> Salute me, I am strength. All this with a languid posture, there is no mistaking his meaning. Now a Negro girl strolls past the corner lounger, her whole body panging and posing, a slight shoulder movement that calls attention to her bust that is all of a dare. A hippie undulation below the waist that is a sheaf of promises tied with conscious power. She is acting out. I'm a darn sweet woman and you know it. <laughs> These little plays by strolling players are acted out daily in a dozen streets in a thousand cities and no one ever mistakes the meaning. So, she, she, so this is Zora, she says, you know, everything that the Negro does is drama. Everything that we do is art. She also says that we have a will to adorn. We, we want to make things beautiful. We want to make them um, better. Mo better is what she would say we would say. <laughs> and so she says that, you know, she goes on to talk about one of the things that we've contributed to is language. And um, she talks about, you know, we, we changed aren't to ain't. And, you know, we use words like ham shank, battle ham, double team, bodaciously, muffle jawed. Um, she says that, you know, one of the unique contributions to language is the double descriptive. I said, mo better, she would say, high tall, low down, top superior, sham polish, lady people, kill dead, hot boiling. <laughs> and then uh, also uh, verbal nouns. She features somebody I know to funeralize somebody. Uh, um, you know, puts the shamery on them. And then she says, you know, nouns from verbs, won't stand a broke, she won't take a listening, he won't stand straightening. She says, on the walls of the homes of the average Negro, one always finds a glut of gaudy calendars, wall pockets, and advertising lithographs. The sophisticated white man or Negro would tolerate none of these, even if they bore a likeness to the Mona Lisa. No, no commercial art for decoration, nor the calendar, nor the advertisement spoils the picture for this lowly man. He sees the beauty in spite of the declaration of the Portland Cement Works or the butcher's <laughs> announcement. I saw in Mobile a room in which there was an overstuffed mohair living room suite, an imitation mahogany bed and chiffarobe, a console Victrola. The walls were gaily papered with Sunday supplements of the Mobile Register. There were seven calendars and three wall pockets, one of them decorated with a lace doily. The mantel shelf was covered with a scarf of deep homemade lace looped up with a huge bow of pink crepe paper. <laughs> it was grotesque, yes, but it indicated the desire for beauty. And decorating a decoration, as in the case of the doily on the gaudy wall pocket, <laughs> did not seem out of place to the hostess. The feeling back of such an act is there can never be enough of beauty, let alone too much. Perhaps she is right. We each have our standards of art, and thus we are all interested parties and so unfit to pass judgment upon the art concepts of others. Uh, this reminds me of my sister who loves leopard print, and she has an entire room decorated in leopard print. And I said to her, I think leopard print is an accent color. But she, <laughs> she doesn't care. She loves it. Another thing that uh, Zora says Negroes do is we like angular. Says the pictures on the walls are hung at deep angles. <laughs> furniture, we have to set it at an angle. I have instances of a piece of furniture in the middle of a wall being set with one end nearer the wall than the other to avoid the simple straight line. Another aspect of, of Negro art is asymmetry. She says, it is the lack of symmetry which makes Negro dancing so difficult for white dancers to learn. <laughs> the abrupt and unexpected changes, the frequent change of key and time, are evidences of this quality in music. 
The dancing of the justly famous Bojangles and Snake Hips are excellent examples. Um, and then she goes on to say, and I don't, I don't want to take too long, um, this, this part I liked. <laughs> she says, discord is more natural than accord. So one of the things she says is that, you know, we come from the African village, and she says, in the African village, nothing is secret. Let me just start here. There is no privacy in African villages. Loves, fights, possessions are, to misquote Woodrow Wilson, open disagreements openly arrived at. The community is given the benefit of a good fight as well as a good wedding. An audience is necessary part of any drama. We merely go with nature rather than against it. Discord is more natural than accord. If we accept the doctrine of the survival of the fittest, there are more fighting honors than there are honors for other achievements. Humanity places premiums on all things necessary to its well-being, and a valiant and good fighter is valuable in any community. So why hide the light under a bushel? Moreover, intimidation is a recognized part of warfare the world over, and threats certainly must be listed under that head, so that a great threatener must certainly be considered an aid to the fighting machine. So then, if a man or woman is a facile hurler of threats, why should he or she not show their wares to the community? Hence, the holding of all quarrels and fights in the open. One relieves one's pent-up anger and at the same time earns laurels in intimidation. Besides, one does the community a service. There is nothing so exhilarating as watching well-matched opponents go into action. The entire world likes action, for that matter. Hence, prize fighters become millionaires. So when I reread this, I thought, this is reality TV she's talking about. <laughs> Likewise, lovemaking is a biological necessity the world over and an art among Negroes. So that a man or woman who is proficient sees no reason why the fact should not be moot, he swaggers. Swag, that's a contemporary one. She struts hippily about. Songs are built on the power to charm beneath the bedclothes. Here again, we have individuals striving to excel in what the community center considers an art. Then if all of his world is seeking a great lover, why should he not speak right out loud? It is all in a viewpoint. Love making and fighting in all their branches are high arts. Other things are arts among other groups where they brag about their proficiency just as brazenly as we do about these things that others consider matters for consideration or matters for conversation behind closed doors. So that was the thing that I got from Zora, um, y'all, that one, we really have to embrace all forms of culture is art, high culture, low culture. Um, yesterday I was down at the DC permitting office and I had been down there a couple of hours and you know, you're waiting, you're waiting, you're waiting for your number to be called and there was a guy who was just having a ball. He was you know, teasing the other guys and I'm sitting there looking at my number like, oh, can we get back to work here? And I just couldn't help but think Zora would have loved this guy. Because <laughs> he was having such fun and, uh, and I was sitting there looking at my watch, ready to go. So anyway, I'm going to close by just reading like a couple of paragraphs of a story that I wrote called Sookie Sookie, um, just because one of the things in preparation for today was reminding myself um, of, you know, um, we really have to, here even at this great Library of Congress, which is whenever anyone visits DC, I send them here as one of my favorite stops on their tour because it's just a wonderful, wonderful institution. It makes me proud to be an American when I stand here. And um, <laughs> it does, it really does. Um, and so um, one of the things I want us to remember is how we, what are we thinking of when we talk about high art? What, what, what constitutes high art? Doesn't, doesn't you know, um, Harry Hippie, who I'm about to read about, doesn't, isn't he high art? And let me just read these three, four paragraphs and then I'll sit down and you can go back to work. He was wearing his lucky blue wing tip gaiters and blue silk paisley shirt, blue pants, three shades of blue in fact, but that was just a side show. The real thing was this lucky feeling that was making the tips of his fingers and toes itch. He weighed his options, coasted the big Lincoln up and down Highway 51, twice up and back before deciding on gold mine. He normally didn't like to play gold mine because it wasn't where the pretty ladies hung out. He was in such a mood that he hadn't even stopped to buy the cigarettes he only smoked while at the casino, instead checking the glove compartment for the two black and miles he'd stowed there after last week's all-nighter, one of those long ones where he didn't win anything but really enjoyed himself. 
His wife hated the smell of smoke and had a habit of opening all the windows in the house after he arrived home, even if it was the dead of winter, even if he hadn't smoked a single thing, a habit that irritated him to no end because it let in the racket of the dogs out back barking at everything on four wheels that rolled down the stretch of road in front of the house. A valet tried to flag him down, but he bypassed him and entered the VIP parking area. Harry would never let one of those young buddy boys park his Lincoln. They didn't have know how to drive, and they were likely to park his baby next to some big pickup truck. He patted his pocket for his Players Club card. Tonight would make getting through a week of work in a house smelling like corn worth it. It felt like a year of Sundays between the weeks when he picked up his check from the trailer that served as headquarters for the Lovejoy Trucking Company, an operation run by two sisters who had spent years on the road, barking in the CB radios before there were cell phones, layering their clothing on so thick they looked like men if they got stranded on the road at night. The automatic gold doors parted, and even though Harry didn't sight any lovelies right away, he strutted, stepped up in his stiff new shoes, scanned the room. Two young men slouched at a slot machine near the door eyeing him. He knew the type, buddy boys who scoped out the elderly. One hand on the slot button, the other palm in a cell phone. Want to be rapidites. Not that Harry was elderly. He believed he was 70 going on 55, and he refused to make it a day past that. What the fuck y'all looking at, he growled under his breath. They checked him out, checking them out. In his day, he had been a pretty decent street fighter. He put some extra bounce in his step in case they were wondering. If they wanted his jewelry, they would be shit out of luck because he didn't wear much of it, didn't even want to give them a target. And what he did wear wasn't real, except for the lion pendant with the tiny emerald eyes hanging from the chain around his neck, a proper piece for a Leo moon such as himself, bought from Hockettumi Pawn Shop over in Batesville the day after he struck his biggest jackpot ever. He liked jewelry all right, but he preferred cars, a Lincoln Continental, a Cadillac Broham from his younger days, Nothing but the best for the guy they used to call Harry Hippie. First order of business was to get a drink. Harry was an old school player, crown royal over ice. In his closet at home, he stashed a collection of royal purple velvet bags full of loose change. He swirled the ice cubes with his middle finger and surveyed the casino from the bar, the bells jingling in his ears, rousing him. He would start small, he decided, because he had $500 to blow and didn't intend on losing it. Tonight, something was sure to hit. Blackjack, roulette, dog track, maybe even a game of bingo when the room wasn't overwhelmed by old ladies sucking on squares. The only thing he didn't like were the computerized games like video poker. Where the hell was the fun in that? Some people swore by the 9-6 video poker machines, but Harry knew that the best odds, if you knew what you were doing, were blackjack and poker. Roulette was a little under 6%, the craps table as high as 9 and the slots flav favored the house so much you had to pay the, play the high roller machines to even have a chance. But Harry would try not to think of odds tonight. He was going to ride this wave. Thank you. What great readings. Very exciting. Um, my name is Kathy Kirst. I'm from the American Folklife Center here at the library. We're a division that holds ethnographic uh, materials of all kinds. And I'm going to be talking a little bit about um, the Hurston materials we have in our division. In 1938, Zora Neale Hurston wrote an essay entitled Folklore and Music intended to be published in a work called The Florida Negro. In it, she wrote, folklore is the boiled down juice of human living. It does not belong to any special place, any time, nor people. In folklore, as in everything else that people create, the world is a great big old serving platter, and all the local places are like eating plates. Whatever is on the plate must come out of the platter, but each plate has a flavor of its own because the people take the universal stuff and season it to suit themselves. And this local flavor is what is known as originality. <laughs> known by so many as a literary figure, a gifted author, Hurston is also known as an astute and perceptive ethnographer. She studied anthropology at Columbia University in the mid-1920s with Franz Boas and Ruth Benedict, 
Boaz urged her to travel to her native Florida to gather African-American folklore, which she did on numerous trips. The American Folklife Center holds a variety of fascinating Hurston materials relating to her folklife research. We are a division predominantly of unpublished ethnographic field documentation in many formats. Our Hurston collections include audio recordings that she collected from individuals or groups or were made of her own speaking and singing in Florida and Georgia in 1935, in Haiti in 1936, in Washington, D.C. at the National Folk Festival in 1938, and during her work for the Federal Writers Project in Florida in 1938 and 39. We also have accompanying correspondence and manuscripts describing her work. Here's a photo of Hurston, which we believe was taken at a recording site in Florida. Um, this photo resides in the Prints and Photographs division, and I'm going to be showing a few photographs that are not housed in our division, um, the American Folklife Center, but are in the Prints and Photographs collection, and I appreciate the fact that they're available and thank them for the opportunity to show them. These photos that I've chosen are specifically related to the collections that we have in our division. It was really hard to decide what audio recordings to play for you since so much of it that we have is so compelling. I've chosen three selections from the late 1930s that feature Hurston speaking and singing and they de demonstrate her ethnographic eye and her documentary style. In April 1938, Hurston joined the staff of the Florida Federal Writers Project to, col to collect African American folklore in her native Florida. The Writers Project was one of the many innovative New Deal projects created by the government during the 1930s under the Roosevelt administration. These projects ushered in a new and exciting era of federal involvement and support in the documentation of traditional music, speech, and the arts of ordinary Americans. The Federal Writers Project was part of the Works Projects Administration, where authors, historians, artists, and folklorists like Hurston were hired to collect folklore, history, oral narratives, songs, and more to document the lives of ordinary Americans. As part of her work, Hurston collected folk speech, work songs, tall tales and lies, narratives about preachers, children's games, and much more that documented African-American performance styles and genres. The first recording that I'd like to play is a description that Hurston makes of track lining, which is the laying of track for making the railroads. Uh, now, when the men are lining, they put the rail down, and then, of course, the captain, he squats straddle of it and uh, looks down it so he can tell when it's lined up in, in, in uh, exact line with the others. And if the carrot, well, he'll say, uh, shove it over. Uh, and the carrot too far, he'll say, send it back. And when they get it exactly in line, he'll tell them, join it ahead. But they incorrupted that to join ahead, and all of them say, join ahead, for join it ahead. And uh, so uh, this song is uh, about a lining, and the rhythm goes with it. They put, the, they put this uh, lining bar, this long steel bar, crowbar, between their legs, and, uh, and, and pull, so they have greater purchase and pull back on it. Well, wait a minute. They pull back. How are they facing in relation to the rail? They, their back is to the rail. In, in, other, in, other, words, in other words, they're, they're pulling up on the bar. Pulling up on the bar. They don't have to look at the rail because that's the captain's job to see when it's uh, uh, right. What do they do? do, they, do, they, do they, how, do they, how do they get it under the, under the rail? They just push the flange of this, this lining bar under the rail and then pull back on it. Do they, look, do they have to look back at it or do they, can they feel it? Oh, they can just feel it. Sometimes they look back, you know, but uh, most of them they just can feel it and they, they send it back on them. Well, uh, are you saying, let's make this talk more long. Yes. You were explaining that there's different rhythms that they, they have. You get, you get the sense. You hear Herbert Halpert sort of peppering her with with sort of ornery questions, <laughs> sort of annoying questions, but he was also working as a folklorist and was sort of egging her on to describe things. Um, now I'd like to play um, a, 
an audio recording of Hurston singing a, the, the song that, sh, that accompanies this process of track lining. Um, it's a work song, sometimes called Can't You Line It, uh, sometimes called Shove It Over, or uh, Can't You Move Them. And it's got a call and response chant that's used in, in the laying of the new track. This song is called Shove It Over, and it's a line and rhythm pretty generally distributed all over Florida. It was sung to me by Charlie Jones on a railroad construction camp near Lakeland, Florida. How long ago? Uh, that, I gathered that in 1933. 1933. When I get in the hill and noise, I'm going to spread the news about the Florida boys. Shove it over, hey, 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 oh, can't you line it? Oh, shaka, laka, 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 <clears throat> can't you move it? Hey, 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 oh, can't you try? Eat him up, whiskers, or he won't shave. Eat him up, body lights, he won't bathe. Shove it over. Hey, 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 oh, can't you lie in there? Oh, shack a lack a lack a lack a lack a lack <clears throat> Can't you move it? Hey, 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 oh, can't you try? So um, the third selection I'd like to play for you is Uncle Bud, which is a social song. It's a body juke song. Um, recorded by Stetson Kennedy, who, like Herbert Halpert on the other recordings, is is asking questions and so on. Um, so you'll hear his voice on this recording as well. Uncle Bud is, is not a work song. It's a sort of social song for amusement. And it's so widely distributed. It's growing all the time by incremental repetition. And it is uh, known all over the South. No matter where you go, you can find verses of Uncle Bud. And, uh, it's the favorite song, and the men get to working in every kind of work, and they just yell down on Uncle Bud, and nobody particularly leaves it. Everybody puts in his verse when he gets ready, and uh, Uncle Bud grows and grows and grows. Uh, what's the song before the, the, uh, the respectable ladies? Never. It's one of those <laughs> juke songs, and the woman that they sing Uncle Bud in front of is a juke woman. <laughs> and, uh, of course, heard it from women. Yes, I heard from him. <laughs> yes. <clears throat> Uncle Bud's a man, a man like this. He can't get a woman going to use his fist. Uncle Bud, Uncle Bud, Uncle Bud, Uncle Bud, Uncle Bud. Oh, I'm going to town, going to hurry back. Uncle Bud's got something I sure do like. Uncle Bud, Uncle Bud. Uncle Bud, Uncle Bud, Uncle Bud. Oh, little cat, big cat, a little bit of kitten, gonna work their tails if they don't stop shitting. Uncle Bud, Uncle Bud, Uncle Bud, Uncle Bud, Uncle Bud. Uncle Bud's got corn, the show needs chucking. Uncle Bud's got gals, the show needs banking. Uncle Bud, Uncle Bud, Uncle Bud, Uncle Bud, Uncle Bud. Uncle Bud's got gals, got no hairs. Uncle Bud's got cotton, ain't got no squares. Uncle Bud, Uncle Bud, Uncle Bud, Uncle Bud, Uncle Bud. Anyway, and it goes on and on. And it's all on the library's website. You can listen to it. Um, so that, that's just, the, those are just three audio recordings that we have. Many more. We've got many more. And, um, um, Ann Hoog, who's also in the audience, you can, and who can answer questions if you have them as well as I, after, after the presentation, um, wrote a blog last year on Zornil Hurston. And um, in it, it's on the American Folklife Center's blog site, and it features Let, uh, Let the Deal Go Down, a gambling song where she describes how it works, and it's, it's a fascinating um, uh, sort of recording about that. So I have just a few photographs, and as I said, these are um, also from the Prints and Photographs Division. Um, these are children um, that uh, Zora worked with to record and um, document their songs and their games in Eatonville in 1935. 
And there she is with the children. I, I especially like this one. Anyway, with the field research done by Hurston and other researchers in the 1930s, the lives, music, speech, memories, and artistic efforts of ordinary Americans were documented. Luckily, the library has a huge body of New Deal materials and actually quite a large selection of Zora Neale Hurston materials. In the American Folklife Center, we are pleased to house many of these recordings related to her ethno ethnographic research. Um, including these stunning examples of Zora, Zora's voice, her vitality, her wit, and her deep cultural understanding. Um, all of the recordings that I played for you, plus many more, are available on the, on the library's website, as well as many more photographs of Zora Neale Hurston. Um, I recommend that you explore them, and um, Anne and I will be here after the presentation then you can ask us any questions you'd like. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Kathy, and thank you, Anne, and uh, uh, thanks to all of you for coming out. And of course, thanks to our two uh, readers, uh, Marita Golden and Dolan Perkins Valdez. Uh, you should come up and uh, talk to Alice Bernie and Rosemary Plakis about the collections that we have up here, the tabletop materials that we have. Also, as you walk out, you'll see that there's a, um, a table with books for sale by both of our, our readers today. I'm sure they would love to sign copies of their books, and we do have copies of Zora Neale Hurston's books. Uh, January 22nd at noon uh, in uh, the room upstairs, uh, we have a great contemporary African-American poet, Terrence Hayes, coming to give a lecture as part of the Bagley Wright reading series. Uh, you can find out about that uh, in our, in our um, sheet, uh, as long as, which is, which is uh, in the back there, as well as uh, other readings that we have, readings and lectures that we have coming up. So thanks for coming out and hope to see you soon. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.